Hey guys, Mary here, and I'm going to talk to you about Rise of the Tomb Raider, the second game in the three-part series from developer Crystal Dynamics. I got to play the game for three hours, and I'm going to break down everything new from the first game, as well as anything else I found interesting. First up are the stats and skill points. In the original game, you had survivor and hunter skills. They were skills all in a row that you unlocked as you completed them. In this game, you have three, brawler, hunter, and survivor. Brawler is hand-to-hand -hand combat and healing. So in this one, there's multiple tiers of skills that get unlocked as you master the skills. Some of the skills can work together, such as thick-skinned and heart of stone, so that you can take less damage. In the hunter tier, it helps with hunting and scavenging. These were gonna feel really familiar. These are ones like recovering arrows or looting more off of corpses or looting faster. Uh, finally, you have survivor crafting and exploration abilities. These help you craft faster and on the run. You can craft while you're in the world now. You don't have to be at a bonfire. So this is gonna be really helpful for times when you need to heal. So you can hide in combat, craft an item, and then use it to heal yourself while you're still fighting. This is also where you'll boost physical stats, like taking less damage when you fall from heights. There's a lot more customization in the skills now, and where I found in the first game, as soon as I had a point to spend, there was only like a few places to put it. Now there's countless items, so you're able to customize your Lara much more to your own individual playstyle. So if you don't want to be in combat a lot, you want to be more of a stealthy player, you're going to put more points into the hunter and survivor. Whereas if you're fighting a lot, you're probably going to put a lot of those points into Brawler, which will help you stay alive. Next up are your weapon options and upgrades. As with the first game, you're going to start with your climbing axe, but you very quickly get your bow. And as far as I got, you could also change into two outfits. You get one for expedition and one for raiding tombs. And yes, you can wear your tank top in the snow if you want to. You'll find ammo parts in the world just like in the first game, so I'm currently searching for two more semi-auto pistol parts. Once you find all the parts, or you just stumble across an entire weapon like this revolver, you can upgrade it. This is also a tiered system similar to skill points that you can unlock for more customization. Upgrades are similar to the last game, things like stability or more damage, and they're in exchange for resources that you find in the world. Cloth, animal skins, feathers, and then various parts. These items, especially in the beginning of the game, like your bow, require a lot of materials, so you'll want to be constantly hunting so that you have everything you need when you're ready to upgrade. Finally, there's an inventory section that will help you upgrade your ammunition and equipment. Equipment upgrades are things you might remember, like holding more arrows or more shotgun shells. It's incredibly helpful, but a lot of these materials are the same materials used for upgrading your weapon. So a lot of times you'll have to choose between your weapon doing more damage or Lara's ability to hold more bullets. In the ammunition upgrades, those are things like hollow point bullets or stealthy arrows for additional damage and control. They are also unlocked in exchange for resources. When it comes to the world, there are some changes to crafting and combat. As I mentioned before, you can craft on the fly now. You don't have to be at a bonfire. So as long as you've learned the skill and you have the materials, for example, the poison mushrooms for a poison arrow, the game will prompt you to craft wherever you are. Something new that I've never seen in the game before is a shopkeeper. It gives you tools and gear in exchange for gold coins that you find scattered throughout the area. So it's a little bit more motivation for you to scavenge the area for tombs and hidden caves. There's items in there that you might find familiar, like the rope ascender, and he'll also offer tools, which will unlock new tiers of weapon upgrades in your skill tree. So it sounds like it'll actually require gold for you to be able to get certain weapon upgrades. When it comes to combat, there's some additional player choice involved. You can choose between being stealthy or just being a fighter. Some areas require you to fight, and others you can get by without killing anyone. You'll know which ones they are because they basically are guaranteeing you at some point you're going to be down a corridor and there's a dude there, he's going to find you. But even in these areas that require you to fight, there's lots of bushes that you can stay hidden in, and you can shoot arrows for silent takedowns. You get XP for stealth kills, so it's best to try and be sneaky as opposed to just going in guns blazing. There's also more opportunity for world items like lanterns that you can use to your advantage. You can use them in combat, or they'll just help you get to another area. The Soviet encampment area is the most open world I've ever seen in a Tomb Raider game. 
There's so much to discover, and you can do a lot of it in any order you like, depending on what's interesting to you. If you pause the game, there's a region summary that shows everything that you can find, from hidden tombs to relics to coin caches that you can spend at the shop. There are new optional missions in the game. These are side quests, and they help you make allies that will give you rewards. For example, this one will give you a lockpick. You don't have to do them, but it looks like these dudes might come back to help you later on, so it seems like it's in your best interest to do them. There's also new challenges that give you additional XP. These are things like exploring dark caves, and these are not the same as tombs. Yes, optional tombs are back. There seems to be a lot more of them, and they reward you with treasures and relics. You'll be able to know when you're in the area of one, it will prompt you and say that there's an optional tomb nearby. You can find documents which help fill in additional pieces of the story, including what your allies are doing there. You can also find murals, and this helps Laura learn languages. If she reads about like five or so pieces, she becomes familiar with the language, and then you can go back and cover more secrets from pieces you couldn't read before. You can also find relics again, and just like before, you're rewarded for turning them around and zooming in and checking them out in more detail. Sometimes you'll uncover a little bit more about that item. And you'll also find a range of strong boxes and survival packs that will reward you with inventory items for additional crafting. So you can go through all these caves and optional tombs at any point you want, but if you want to go back to the main mission, you can press in the right stick. It will highlight the next checkpoint, which will in turn progress the story. You'll always be able to return later to this area via fast travel if you missed something. So that's most of what I learned from the three hours I got to play. Every time I see this game, I get more and more excited. They basically took what I loved about the first Tomb Raider and then just doubled down on it. There's way more customization from Laura's skills to how you fight to what you explore, all within an area that's way, way bigger than anything we've seen in the first game. I'll continue to update you guys with anything else Tomb Raider related, so stay tuned.